Heneuai Reserve is made up of steep hills and wilding gullies overlooking Banks Peninsula's rugged eastern coastline. It's managed by 79-year-old botanist Hugh Wilson, who also lives on the secluded land where he's spent years encouraging nature to reforest what was once rough and gorsy farmland. Cosmo Kentish Barnes was there recently to find out more. Hello. Very nice to meet you. You too. Good. Now, Hugh, um, we are about to head out into the reserve. Can you tell me what we can see from from your little house here? Ah, every direction is a beautiful view, but looking down the valley, we just see a big valley of regenerating native forest down to Ōtanarito Bay. Um, and the, the wonderful news is that we've just extended the reserve right down to the sea there, down to the beach. But then if you turn in other directions, you just see a lovely skyline of regenerating bush and even some old growth patches of bush up on the skyline, skyline beach and then just a wee bit further around to the highest part of the reserve. Mm. That's Taratari Hill or Stony Bay Peak. It goes up into the subalpine zone. So in every direction is a beautiful view. Is there a farm down by the beach there? That's, at the bottom that's of the my valley? neighbours, the Nabis. They've been here since almost the beginning of European settlement. The family has. Yep. Uh, Faye has got Māori ancestry as well. Um, and Brian has got way back to French ancestry. So that's an interesting mixture in terms of the peninsula's history. Mm. And we can see some of their farmland on the heads. Uh, and yeah. I guess that's what sheep and cattle, it is. grazing sheep and, land? Sheep and cattle, yep. 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 Although that, that right-hand headland is a famous historical site as well. That was where the, the first major interaction between Ngaitahu and Ngati Māmoi was. About 1700? Hmm. Moki came down with a fleet of canoes to settle some score. The words kinship relations as well. And it was a pa called Parakakriki on the headland there. There's nothing you can see there now. But there's lots of implements and artefacts came from that area. Mm. Yeah. And when did you first come here? Uh, it was 1987 the reserve started. But before that, I was, as a botanist, I was doing a botanical survey of Banks Peninsula, so I had visited here already. Mm. And this little farmlet that was a nucleus of Hinawai was owned by a friend of my brother, Jim. So I camped here, yeah, before the trust bought this first block of land. So this was farmland? It was all farmed, can you believe? Yeah. Oh, all yes. this nonsense about native bush growing slowly, it's all complete bullshit. Oh, I'm not allowed to say that. <laughs> It's complete nonsense. Uh, people <laughs> won't mind, I'm sure. <laughs> no, you're right. I mean, the valley is entirely covered in bush. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. Where does the name Hinawai come from? Oh, it's a lovely legend about Hinawai the water maiden and Unuku the rainbow, yeah. But it's not, I have to admit, it's not a local Māori name. We did ask permission whether we could use that name. Mm. Also, not permission, but just approval from the local iwi, a local runanga. Um, yes, so it means the water maiden. Did they think that was suitable for this yeah, land? They did, and I loved it. it. Well, I didn't think of that name. It was on the old bull bell stencil from this little farmlet. Yeah. Bit of history. We were going to come up with all sorts of invented Māori names and English names, and then we found this bull bell stencil, and it seemed perfect. Mm -hmm. So that's how it happened. And it all started with the 109 hectares, and now you've yeah. got over 1,500. Yeah, about, we look after about 1,600, something like that, 1,600 hectares. And 192 of those are actually owned by another trust, which we look after. It's a North Island trust called the Native Forest Restoration Trust. Yes. Do you have volunteers? Well, funnily enough, we don't use volunteers very much um, because we've got this little team of four of us who all know what we're doing. And, uh, well, I think we do. So there's Ash, Max. Yeah, and, and Paul, who and you Paul. won't meet today, he's down the bottom. He's actually building a very sophisticated style across a fence on our new beach track. Um, but since we put out a little documentary about a, a video one, Happen Films put it out, we've been swamped with offers of volunteers, and it's lovely, but it's just impractical. We can't manage vast numbers of volunteers. And if people are interested in watching that documentary, it's called Fools and I'm not Dreamers. The only fool. There was more, more than <laughs> <Sorry>. one. <laughs> but um, a lot of people come here and say they've seen the video and they're very keen to see the whole project. So it's been really good mm. from all over the world as mm. well. Well, talking about that, when I parked my car up by the road, there was a French man wandering around. Yep, yep. yep. Now we get people from everywhere. I said mm. hello and he said bonjour. <laughs> comment comment allez-vous? <laughs> <laughs> So people come here without asking permission. 
They just can freely come in, yes. visit the visitor centre, walk wherever they want along the track system. Yeah. And how many kilometres of tracks have you built here? It's, a, it's about 20 kilometres, I think, including two tracks that run through Purple Peak Reserve. And what should people expect if they come and do one of these walks? They expect to see some old growth forest, many hectares of it, but then many, many hectares of regenerating native forest. Yes. And the bird life is really good, and lizards and insects and all sorts, spiders galore, streams, waterfalls, yep. And where are we about to head to now? What's um, happening today? Today, well, we're just going to be walking over along West Track to the work face through lots and lots of regenerating bush on what was once farmland. Mm. Um, where actually Ash and Max, if it stays dry, will be taking gorse and broom out of the boundary there. And then we'll end up in the old growth forest, uh, only about 4% of Hinawai's old growth forest. Wandering through it, people don't realise that because you're under a high regenerated canopy anyway. But, but when they go into the tall red beech forest on beech terrace, they realise they're in something different. Another world. It is another world. And it was a world that was all so dominant here 700 years ago. Now, Max, um, how long have you been um, working here? This is our third, third summer. How did you find out about um, the reserve? I grew up here on Banks Peninsula, um, mm. around in Pigeon Bay, um, so kind of was always aware of it. And then saw a job advertised for a summer worker and kind of jumped on it and yeah. ended up getting a gig and they kept wanting me to come back. And Ash, you've both got backpacks on. What are you carrying? Oh, I've got a bit of uh, everything with me for the day, really. Uh, lunch, the most important thing. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, no, we've got, um, we've got a loppers, uh, a pruning saw, and a tiny bit of herbicide as well. Which, yes. Yeah. So could you be out for the entire day doing yeah. work? Yeah. Leave the house about 8.30 and come back by 5. Mm. Yeah. OK, well, let's, um, let's head off. All right. <laughs> They're good, those walking sticks, aren't they? I got talked into them and they're terrific. It's terrific for balance. As, as we get older, we lose a bit of balance. And crossing streams and things, it's fantastic. I walked up to the top of Mount Summers recently and oh. honestly, I really did need that walking stick. Oh, isn't Mount Summers terrific, though? Yeah, it was yeah. hard yakka. Hard yakka. I love that sort of sloping, gentle snow tussock. At yes. the top, you don't expect it. It's beautiful. It looks pointed from the plains. Now we are at the visitor centre here, and this is the old, what, shearing shed? Yeah, the old wool shed, yeah, yeah. In 1987 or 88, a friend called Martin Aldering, he just made it his project to convert this. We'll just have a look in the door if you yeah, like. Yeah, sure, yeah. In, in the accommodation and information centre, and it's been a fantastic facility for the reserve. It's used every day by day visitors, and we sleep up to 12 people. <laughs> Ah, so we've just come in and there's a big relief map of uh, the reserve. There are books here and photographs. You've really got a history of Hinawai on the wall, haven't you? Yeah. How do people find out about the, the lodge here? Oh, they simply have to ring me up in the evenings between about 7.30 and 9.30. But we close it for overnight accommodation, we close it for the winter. So we end at the end of this month for overnight accommodation and then it opens again on the 1st of October. There aren't many shearing sheds that are totally surrounded by a native bush. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nature's just itching to put the bush back and, and has been getting on with it. E even while I was grazing here, the farmers have to keep fighting the kanaka, mm. colonising their pastures. And we've just taken away the things that slow all that down, like farm animals, possums, goats. We've got a bit of an incipient deer, wild deer problem now. So um, we try and remove all the deleterious things that are stopping nature just getting on with putting the bush back. And so that's all the serious work's done by nature here. We, we plant very little, only just a few specimen native trees around the visitor centre and the houses. And all these millions and millions of regenerating native trees are all natural regeneration. There's n just absolutely no shortage of seed. And no shortage, even though we've lost some of our bird species, there's no shortage of dispersal mechanisms, either by birds or by wind. So seed production is not an issue. Nature's done all the planting, all the significant planting. 
Now we've just passed a pest trap. Yep. What um, are you targeting? Um, well, that's actually for stoats and ferrets, but it's a complicated thing here because the rats are the worst of the lot, and we can't control the rats, not on 1,600 hectares, not effectively. We control them around the houses. Oh, sorry. That's okay. Um, but we do, we do target the mustelids and the cats down by the penguins at the sea, and we're really hammering the possums. Now, gorse has played a big part in the regeneration project, hasn't it? It has, it has. And, of course, we did get some flack from that at first because when we said that gorse was infesting this landscape and the only way of effectively getting rid of it was to let the native bush come through and shade it out and kill it. Yeah. It was, of course, met with a lot of scepticism. But um, there's, there's no sceptics around us now because they'd have to shut their eyes to be sceptical now. This bit of land we're on now, mm. this was basically gorse-infested pasture. And there is still some gorse, but very old and lanky, and more natives than gorse now. All these things are shade-tolerant natives that have just come through mm. under the gorse canopy. Mm. Mm. So you, t- you, you tolerate the gorse yeah. because it creates a yeah. nurse canopy for the natives. Yeah, and tolerate's the right word, because um, we'd rather not have it. And there's natives that do the same. There's a harrier hawk just oh, gliding over there. Um, the, the native Karnaka is the, is the native coloniser, woody coloniser here. Here's a big old gorse bush, and it's on its last legs. And in 2014, it was 28, about 28 years old. And you're holding the gorse uh, oh. bush as though it's your old friend. And not even prickly, you see. Mm. Well, the, the foliage is prickly still, but yeah. the trunk isn't. It's an appalling weed for farmers. They've spent all their lives trying to fight it on this marginal hill country, and, and sometimes with success, but sometimes it's just depressingly impossible. So I can completely understand both the hatred of gorse and the scepticism that it gives way to native forest. I understand it, but it's wrong. Did you ever think that the land would change so quickly when you first started? Um, <laughs> I sound a bit pompous. Yes, I did. I did think it would happen <laughs> at about this speed, but it's um, it's very refreshing to see it's happening. Yeah, some some of the farmers used to say to me, um, how do you know that the natives will come through the gorse? And I'd say things like, well, you can never be certain about everything, but I'm about as certain that the sun will come up tomorrow morning. Looking down towards the valley, we can see the forest sway like a green ocean in the wind. Yes, beautiful. It is beautiful. Those big trees are beeches punching up through the carnica. The carnica makes a beautiful nurse canopy for beech. A beech is really interesting on Banks Prince because it's only naturally in the southeast corner. And then it short, shortly will be in the old growth forest. Incidentally, Cosmo, this is another slip with lots of natives beating the gorse. See that? You think gorse grows fast, but that's fuchsia, seven finger, pate. Poroporo grows a and wine berry especially grows immensely quickly. And Mahoi, one of our commonest native hardwood, even more common than Kanuka, but shade tolerant. Now there is a bench here. And we can sit down and admire this huge and majestic totara. Beautiful totara, maybe 600 years old, we're just guessing. Well, more than a guess, a sort of educated guess. <laughs> yeah. And it's a way, when you think of what this has seen, because this would have been, um, it's not, it would have germinated not long after Polynesian settlement, maybe 150 years after Polynesian settlement. And when Captain Cook sailed right past our bay in the Endeavour in February 1770, this tree would have been quite a sizable tree. And it's not a really a typical tortoise shape, is it? It's very bushy, because it's been growing in the open for a long time. Now the regenerating forest is all around it, but it's sticking way up above it. And it's a male? Yes, it's a male. Yet the podocarps all have their sexes on separate trees. But there's plenty of females around too. We've got tortoise regenerating beautifully here. And the other podocarps too, kakatea, matai, three species of tortoise. Yeah. From what you've learnt about um, the work you've done here, what would you say to people that have marginal hill country land that they're not sure about what to do with? You have to be careful what you tell people to do, don't you? Yeah. I uh, know, but it's fantastic on Banks Peninsula. Uh, it's not just because of what Hinawai, but Hinawai is a lovely example of what happens. 
Um, but they were doing it anyway, to some extent. But now more and more people are just realising it's ridiculous to try and keep farming steep gullies and things when you can get all, you can get carbon credits for them as well, but all of the biodiversity gains also. Mm. So more and more people are fencing off their gullies here on the peninsula. It's it's very, I'm um, hopeful really. Mm. And talking about carbon credits, they are really important to this reserve, aren't they? Oh, they're, they're so complicated. Though. But yes, we do. Um, a lot of our land purchase fund comes from carbon credit income. So um, we get carbon credits for regenerating natural forests. We've actually had a premium to some extent because of the broker that we were using, Toy2, um, based at Manaki Whenua, Land Care Research. <laughs> um, so we get a bit of a, a biodiversity premium as well. People, businesses want to buy Hinawai credits because there's all the biodiversity pluses as well. So um, it is. it has been good and it's been complicated as well because initially you think, well, these trees are going to grow anyway. Um, and uh, we're, what we really seem to be doing is just solving people's consciences while they go on emitting. But it hasn't really worked like that. We only sell to businesses who are committed to carbon zero in a fairly short term. So you pick and choose. We do. Who purchases these credits? We do. Yeah. Yeah, we sort of um, ethically vet every business that our carbon credits are sold to. It's quite interesting. And how much money can that generate? Well, to give you an idea, about one hectare of regenerating forest like this sequesters every year about up to 10 tonnes of carbon dioxide. That's a gas. That's 10 tonnes of carbon dioxide so gas. Um, and sequesters it in these in the, all the plant materials, the wood and the foliage and the litter on the ground and everything. And uh, the price per ton or per unit, a unit is one ton, metric ton of carbon dioxide. So that started off about, the lowest we've ever got was about $15 per ton, but then it went up to way above $70, and it shrunk back a bit now, but um, it is a significant income for sure. Mm. And uh, some, <laughs> sometimes I've been called an ecological imperialist by the neighbours, but most of the neighbours are right behind what we're doing. Yeah, why would they now. say that? Well, because we seem to be wanting more and more land. <laughs> but, but the good thing is the carbon money goes into the purchase of more land, which we wouldn't have been able to buy otherwise, and it's sequestering more carbon. So I think it's a very good way of using mm. carbon credit money. Mm. And recently you purchased, what, about 80 hectares of land? Well, that's our biggest land? news lately. Well, Down um, by the sea? Yes. We do reach the sea in Stony Bay with our lovely neighbours, the Armstrongs, over there. But we have had a bit of an issue with access to the beach on Tanarito Valley here. And now we've bought land on the northeast side of the bay and we're just in the process of putting a walking track down. So public access will be there, carefully managed. Hmm. And that's thanks to the carbon credits and donations. It is, it is. Carbon credits and donations are two huge sources of income now. That's a brown creeper's calling there, which is a unique South Island bird. And they're here in huge numbers. Oh, this is a real stronghold for I beep, beep. A little kind of squeaky noise. Yeah, yeah. That's saying its Māori name all the time. Beep, 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 beep. Yeah. That is the name of your newsletter. Oh, yes, it is. And the idea is that it's always chitter, chittering away about how good life is on the reserve. Yes, and you send out a newsletter twice a year, twice and a year. it's all handwritten. It is, it is. Why it don't is. you use a typewriter or a computer? Well, because we're trying to keep some of these lovely old things alive. People are forgetting how to write and how to think sometimes, do I think? <laughs> so, no, we're keeping all these old things alive. I'm not poo-pooing technology got some marvellous technology myself, a mountain bike, for example, got electricity, that's about it, a rural mailbox, all the, some technology is wonderful. Yes, you haven't got a car, yeah. so would you bike from here all the way to Akaroa? Oh yes, frequently to Akaroa, and up until quite recently I biked into Christchurch, that was my way of getting to Christchurch, but now I haven't got a self-righteous leg to stand on because it's a concession to extreme old age. When I go to Christchurch, which is not a huge amount to do in Christchurch, to be honest, so I don't go all that often, maybe four or five times a year. Um, then I bike over the hill to Akaroa, put my bike on the lovely local Akaroa French Connection shuttle, and then ride off the other end into Christchurch. So it's a wonderfully efficient way of getting to You don't need a car? No, not at all. No, 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 absolutely not. I did own a car once, and it was, what a waste of money and time that was. Tell me about Morris, who started this whole thing off. Yeah, he was a Christchurch businessman, basically, and an accountant. He was he was actually lived his childhood in Wainui, on the other side of Akaroa Harbour from here. And he just set up a fund for purchasing land on Banks Peninsula for conservation purposes. Gosh, how generous. About ten years before I met him. 
So when he met me, who was a botanist wandering all over Banks Peninsula, doing bot a botanical survey, he just asked me to look out for land, and he said, are you, are you interested in the project? And I think I waited about half a nanosecond. I said, yes, and there's been some hassles, but no regrets ever since. And that was, that was 40 years ago, basically, when I first met him. Mm. And you went from 109 hectares to over 1,500. How did that happen? How did you get so much more land? Well, the, the first addition onto the 109 hectares was Alternative Station, which was just so weed infested and by Banks Puncture standards so big <laughs> that it was just, it went through owner after owner trying to make a living out of it. And then when it came on the market, four years after we'd bought this 109 hectares, we were almost surrounded by it. <laughs> just seemed we just had to at least make the effort to buy it. And we bought most of it <laughs> at a traumatic auction. Were you there? I was there. And Morris and I were sitting there wondering how high we should bid. Oh, how nerve-wracking. Whether we had to go and rob a bank or something. <laughs> <laughs> or take it by force. And, mm. Yeah. Now we own all, the trust owns, I, I think this whole notion of owning land is ridiculous actually, but that's the legal language, isn't it? <laughs> the land owns us, really. <laughs> but yeah, that's part of Hinawa now. That made it ten times bigger in one fell swoop. <laughs> And ever since then, we've just been identifying bits of land which really make sense, management-wise and ecologically. And when the opportunities come up, we try and be ready to jump at them. We've arrived at what you call the beach terrace. What's unique about this area well, here? Well, it's just that normally the beach forest remaining on the southeast corner of Banks Prince is in deep gullies. Yeah. And here it's just a flat spur. With um, lots of big old trees. And huge old trees and... Um, because the soils are relatively thin here, there was black beach in here as well. <laughs> what sparked your interest in botany in the first place? I, I suspect it was, um, it's hard to say, isn't it? But I had parents who just loved the outdoors. Dad was a very keen fly fisherman. Mum was a very keen walker. And we went on these amazing family holidays, camping holidays, with two big family tents. Mm. We went all over the place. So I suspect that's what sparked it. Mm. Mm. And ever yeah. since then, it's been a huge thing in your life. Yes, and I always do. I mean, it's been, this has been a large part of my life. Now, I've been here for 37 years. So I'm 79 now. What does that make it? What proportion of my life? It's quite a big chunk. But pre that, I was just always dreaming about looking after a bit of land to let nature reassert herself. Yep. That was Hugh Wilson talking to Cosmo at Hinewai Reserve on Banks Peninsula.